Hey there, everyone. Mr. Lewis here, ready to go through sections five, six, and seven of unit two, population and migration for AP human geography. So here's the gist of it. Up to this point, we've looked at population in two ways. One is distribution. Where is the population most condensed and where is it pretty widely spread out? And we talked about how this can be both due to physical factors and human factors. That was population density. We also looked at what a population is composed of in two elements age and sex ratio at birth, male to female. So this created for us this diagram that allows us to analyze population composition called the population pyramid. And what you're going to see today is all this stuff kind of come together in terms of how the population is changing and how the population pyramid is actually changing, taking on different shapes and figures over time as a population or the country really develops. And when we say develops and we talk about underdeveloped or, or developing or developed countries, fully developed countries, we're talking about industrial development, meaning economic development, uh, social development, political development, medical development, technological development, all of these things that lead to overall a longer life and a higher quality of life with um, you know more food to go around and more of this to go around and all your basic needs are typically met and people live to very old ages. That's what we mean when we talk about development. Doesn't mean that a country is uh, full of people who are just innately better. That's not the case, okay? A lot of it is the circumstances that have been created before we were ever in this society. So, so uh, don't take on that, that concept of, oh, well, countries that are more developed are just better than other people. That's not true at all. There are different ways of living, there are different cultures, and we all have a different definition when we say quality of life. But I just wanna make clear, what we're talking about today is really longer life expectancies and better economies. More money, more jobs to go around, more food, that sort of thing. So without further ado, let's take a look at what we call the demographic transition model. So the first section we're looking at today is called 2.5 Demographic Transition Model. The DTM, or Demographic Transition Model, is something that we're going to be using from this point on to gauge where a country's development is. And it's not always perfectly in line with this model, but it is pretty helpful. And what this allows us to do is to explain these changes that are happening in a population through the model of development. Okay, based on the population's composition and based on its population pyramid, which we worked with last week, we can say something about the development of that country, or at least make a, a, an educated guess as to how developed that country is. So this is what it looks like. This is our demographic transition model. First of all, let's just take this step by step because there's a lot here. On the y-axis, you've got birth and death rates. So these numbers up here would be high birth and death, and then starting down here would be zero. You've also got five stages on the x-axis, stage one, two, three, four, and five, and we'll talk about what each of those stages means. But basically, you're gonna be asked to remember a few things about each particular stage. As we move from stage one to stage five, that is increasing development in a country. So stage one would be very, very underdeveloped, where people are dying of things like famine, pestilence, things like that. Um, people are hungry. People are very impoverished. A large percentage of the population is living on very, very low income. And you, you see very high birth rates and death rates. On the other hand, in stage five, this would be uh, very, very developed, almost overdeveloped, you could say, because this could get to a point where we actually see um, decreasing populations and, and decelerating population growth to one day where the, the population is dwindling and, and actually um, subtracting you know, thousands or potentially millions of people per year. That's not a good place to be. So w those are the two extremes. Very underdeveloped in stage one, very developed in stage five. Now, as we move through these stages, you can see that there are these three curves that move along with us. The green one on top is the birth rate. The blue curve is the death rate. And finally, the orange curve is the total population of that country. The difference between birth and death would show you the natural increase rate, 
natural meaning birth and death. Those are the natural processes that we go through as humans. So this is not including migration. That's very important to understand. There's no migration uh, being in included in this DTM. Now, down here, instead of actually, we could look at stage one and say, hey, birth rate is very high, uh, death rate is also very high, and total population stays pretty low. But you can also see down here, it gives you those three things, birth rate, death rate, and natural increase. So we can use those either on the graph or, for example, if you were told that a country was experiencing both high birth rates and high death rates, what you can see as you move across here is that no other stage has both of those things being very high. This one is high, but death rate is falling rapidly. Okay, so that's not the same. It has to be high birth rate and very high death rate. So that would mean we are in stage one. You can connect these different characteristics of each stage uh, pretty pretty well with those particular stages. They, they have um, particular characteristics that we can automatically assign to that stage. Now, if you were told that a country just had a very high birth rate, that would narrow it down to stages one and two because by stage three, that birth rate is falling, right? By stage four, it's very low. By stage five, rising again. Now, why is that? In the first couple stages of development, the birth rate is very high because A, uh, there usually isn't a lot of opportunity for women to get education and participate in the workforce. So instead, they're having many, many babies, right? They're, they're uh, raising a family and, and having a higher uh, number of babies on average than women in these developed countries would. There's also a lot of gender inequality. So women um, aren't given those opportunities and also are expected to stay at home and birth as many babies as they can in some of those uh, underdeveloped nations. Um, the death rate would be very high because we don't have a great food source as an underdeveloped country. People go hungry. We don't have great medicine that can be spread throughout the entire country. We don't have great access to health care around the country. So death rates stay very high. Access to health care is also a reason birth rates are very high. Women don't have a lot of access to uh, family planning tools and, and education about family planning. So instead, those birth rates stay extremely high. The total population is pretty stable. Okay, it's pretty low, but it's pretty stable because we have a high birth rate, but also, unfortunately, a very high death rate. Now, as we get into stage two, here's what happens. That death rate plummets we get some basic introduction of medicine. We get some uh, uh, food issues kind of taken care of and, and there's a better food supply. This basic stage of development, getting into stage two, drastically lowers this death rate. And although the birth rate stays very high because maybe we haven't developed the best education yet or access to healthcare, there's still this big increase in population because that death rate is dropping. And that could be very basic changes, the introduction of some medicines, some vaccines, uh, or a, a consistent food supply. As we get into stage three, that birth rate starts to drop. So women are getting more opportunities here. Uh, there's more access to family planning tools, contraception, education about those things. And that death rate continues to drop, okay? But it falls a little bit more slowly, as it says here. Because of that, this, this natural increase slows down a little bit but you can see, see that there's still uh, a big natural increase happening. It's just not as rapid as stage two. As we get into stage four, now we're a very developed country, right? And that birth rate is going to be very low because women are out working. Maybe they're only having two babies on average as our fertility rate as opposed to six or seven like you tend to see in a lot of these underdeveloped countries. Um, and again, people in the United States have six, seven more babies than that. My, my dad and mom both come from families of seven children. They're, they're part of the baby boomer era. But the, the point is, it's the average, right? And while people have very large families in developed countries, usually they do so because they can support economically and financially those, those children. In a lot of these underdeveloped countries, that might not be the case necessarily. So... The birth rate gets very low, the death rate gets very low, and because of that, the natural increase is actually uh, pretty stable 
right? It falls, it gets to this very low margin. So this area of gray, remember, the difference between birth and death at any point is the natural increase. It gets to basically zero by the end of stage four. Then we get into stage five, and you can see that the birth rate starts rising again, perhaps because the government is encouraging it, right? Or people see that it is a problem. We can't let our population continue to decelerate or the economy is going to collapse. And the death rate remains very low because you still have good health care. You still have a great medical system, right? People have consistent food sources. So that death rate stays very low. Now, the most interesting part about this at the bottom is that you can see how these population pyramids actually kind of match up with these different stages. The more of a, a bowed out pyramid you see, or I, sh I should say, I guess bowed in almost, it's kind of a, a weird thing to describe, but the, the more pyramid-like and, and swooping out toward the bottom, meaning that birth rate, fertility rates are very high, that tells us that this is a stage one country. The other giveaway between stage one and stage two, notice stage two looks just like a triangle. The reason for that is because of these missing parts on the sides, these missing white portions, okay? That's where people are dying early, so it's not a very thick triangle pyramid as you get to the top, whereas in stage two, it is. It's a little more full at the top because people are living to longer ages. Finally, in stage three, that fertility rate really starts to drop off, and you see sort of this, this steep angle, this flat side toward the bottom in, in ages uh, usually 15 or, or 20 and under. The youth population stops growing at such a rapid pace, but you still have high life expectancies. Then you get to this kind of curvy looking shape where there's a pretty steep drop off from fertility, not meaning it's decreasing. We don't see this moving inward here at the bottom, uh, like inverted, right, which we saw with some countries when we looked at population pyramids last week, but rather there's a pretty consistent downslope. Whereas over here, it's a sharp angle and then a steep drop off here. Here, it's just more consistent all the way down. We don't see these ins and outs and ins and outs. It's just rather consistent. And then finally, when we get to stage five, you could actually start to see this fertility rate decrease and you could see an inverted pyramid where it starts to move toward the middle like we see in Japan, for example. But you could also start to see that birth rate kind of tick back up again. Stage five is a little tricky. But those are our five stages. One through five, it's all about these three things. Birth rate, death rate, and the natural increase. Now, a couple more things about this. As you look around the world, you can see where population increases. This is natural increase. Natural population increase as a percentage is uh, highest and lowest around the world. And as you look at areas that have this kind of creamy white color or gray color, that means that it's pretty low. As you look at areas that have the darker reds, that means that natural increase is very high. And, and unfortunately, it kind of lines up with what we were saying where some of the under, more underdeveloped countries or developing countries, right? They, they've got their toes in the water, so to speak, with development or they are close to being a fully developed country, but they're either very underdeveloped, developing, or developed. And the countries that you see in dark red and, and this uh, sort of bright red color are in some more what we would call developing areas, the middle of South America, Central America, okay, Central Africa and Western Africa, um, Eastern parts of Africa, the Arabian Peninsula, parts of Central Asia and Southeast Asia. This, this lines up with what we were saying about development and natural increase rates. So the next step of this is as countries develop, what causes people to die within the society? And early on in pre-demographic transition periods, like we said earlier, it's, it's pretty much uh, a, a lot of things that we tend to not think about here, but are still killing many, many people around the world. Things like famine, things like pestilence, right? Um, just basic illnesses and people getting sick with diseases and viruses that they should be able to control um, in a place that has that basic access to medicine, but in other areas, 
it might not be as easy to get those things to everybody. Maybe the government isn't as stable. Uh, maybe people just don't know where to go because the information isn't circulated widely enough. And unfortunately, a lot of things that can be prevented end up killing people. It's very sad because it's, it's controllable. And, and developed countries do step in and um, work with those countries to try and keep these things from, from killing a lot of people. And, and it's worked. We have seen a lot less controllable deaths actually killing people over the past uh, few decades. So in early parts of the demographic transition, this is when the natural increase rate balloons and crude death rate starts dropping, right? So you see these receding pandemics, meaning they're kind of going away. We get vaccines out there. There's, there's uh, basic medicine and, and even advanced medicine and scientists and, and uh, doctors who are working on these things. And so they start to get control of those pandemics like uh, the flu, for example, which can totally kill people. It is a very dangerous virus, but in a lot of developed countries, we have vaccines for it. We have medicine for it. In the late stages of the demographic transition, now we see a lot of degenerative diseases and man-made diseases, uh, and you see that actually trickle over into post-development as well, right? So as we get into those stage five type of countries, you see these emerging infections, uh, new diseases, and, and also these delayed degenerative diseases. So what this means is, as people are living to be older, it's going to be things that wear down your body or things that you were always predisposed to, but you don't live long enough to actually experience them. So some things we are genetically predisposed to because our parents had them, but if we don't live long enough, we're, we're never going to experience that because it might not hit your body until a certain time. So the demographic transition in five stages we discussed, and I just want to make sure that what we understand here is that as we move left to right, there are three big changes happening. That birth rate is high, and then it drops. That death rate is very high, and then it drops. The total population, or natural increase, starts very low, starts to balloon, and then kind of flattens out. And we can match that up with the shapes of these different population pyramids. So this is just a measure of development. We're just looking at a lot of different things on this one chart. And we can start to match it up with things on what we call the epidemiologic transition model. Or in other words, what kills people in that society? What is causing most deaths in that society? So Thomas Malthus was this theorist who kind of looked at the world like this. He said that population growth is just connected to our food supply. And he thought that every population is going to run out of food. And, and when it comes time for that, these population checks are actually necessary. We need diseases. We need famine. We need natural disasters because it keeps the population in check. Now, that's a really kind of twisted way of looking at the world. But this is a true theory, and, and his, his uh, theories have been coming up a lot more lately um, with everything that we're going through. But uh, the thing is, he came up with these theories a long, long time ago, and he couldn't predict all the advancements that we have in medical technology, in farming technology, food. Um, so Malthus was kind of out of his reach there a little bit, and, and his theories have been proven to be quite inaccurate because of everything that he could not predict. But people still love to go back to his name, especially when we're looking at Thanos wanting to, uh, you know, destroy the population. Thomas Malthus would approve because more food for everybody. So last but not least, what does the government do about this? When we have population policies, what are the intentions of effects of these policies? As the government sees their population changing, what can they do about it? We're going to talk about four stances they can take. If they see their population getting too big or too small, what might they do? Two of these policies are natalist policies. One is pro, one is anti. Pro-natalist means you're encouraging increased fertility. This was like in Denmark, where the government actually supported and financed this, this uh, uh, marketing campaign to get people to go on vacation and have more children because they saw that their, their fertility rate was, was dropping and they have this big elderly population that is going to need to be taken care of, right? We just talked about how as you get older, 
you're more at risk for certain things, be, be it uh, life threatening or, or not. Um, you know, there are some things that as we get older, we all need help with. And if you don't have young people to A, take care of many of those elderly folk as they get older, and B, replace them in the workforce, the jobs that they once had, then that economy and that society is going to be in some trouble. Antinatalist policies mean that you're discouraging fertility. So if your population is getting out of control and you can't manage it, it's unsustainable for your land, for your, your resources, then you might put in something like China did, the one-child policy, where they actually would fine any families that had more than one child. Now, this was applied to certain areas. There, there were kind of some loose restrictions in different parts of the country, and they have since loosened up on this one-child policy, but it was aimed at discouraging fertility. Now, this led to all kinds of horrible unintended consequences. Um, one of them uh, is that children who were taken by the government because they were more than one child, they were the second child or third child, they were left undocumented. So to this day, some of them are not documented still because they were the second or third child and, and basically uh, have a very difficult time just getting by day-to-day -day life in, in China as an undocumented person there, even though they were totally born in China. Um, and then finally, we have our immigration policies, right? And this gets into the later part of this unit, which is, which is migration. And the thing about migration, it can help fill the, the blank spots in a population, right? We were talking about these pronatalist policies. Denmark decided to go full-on fertility, whereas some countries would say, no, 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 we need workers right now. In that case, if you need workers now, you see your economy tumbling and you need to replace all these retiring uh, workers and, and keep the economy afloat, keep everything producing, generating, growing, you might be more inclined as a country to turn to pro-immigration policies. So if you have an aging population and low fertility rates like Japan, Germany, then you might turn to pro-immigration. Whereas on the other side, if a country is anti-immigration, that could mean that one of two, one of a few things really, uh, uh, many, many different reasons they might be anti-immigration, but we've seen a lot of anti-immigration stances come from overpopulation. We've seen a lot of anti-immigration stances stem from uh, culture clashes, things like that. We've also seen a lot of times where it's a reaction to a large influx of immigrants, right? So in the United States, for example, we've always had immigration. I mean, we're a country built on immigrants, but in the last few years, really the last decade, we've seen a large influx of immigrants from Central America and Mexico, because of that, um, the policy of the federal government has become very anti-immigration. And we're going to talk more about that as we get into the migration side of this unit. So you can see Japan, for example, has been experiencing this. They have uh, uh, have a negative 0.24% population growth rate, meaning it's decreasing. For every 7.5 births out of 1,000, there are 9.9 .9 deaths. So more people are dying, way more people are dying than are being born, and they don't have a ton of immigration. When you look at ethnic groups in Japan, 98.1% of people are Japanese. So it's tough to, to, to convince other people from other countries to come into this culture where you are very, very, very much the minority because Japan is basically a nation state. They are very homogenous, and it's, it's difficult to you know, sort of blend in uh, as an outsider, right, as, a, as an immigrant in Japan. So they have a tough time getting workers to go there. And you can see that they have been increasing the number of foreign workers in Japan since 2007 to try and replace this elderly workforce that is retiring. And, and people live to be very long in Japan, so they need to be taken care of, not just uh, economically, financially, but also, also socially. So you can see the top migrant host countries around the world. The UAE, United Arab Emirates, is by far number one. Almost 90% of their population are migrants, are people from other countries. Now, you're going to read an article about this tomorrow that, that kind of explains uh, what the deal is there. But, but it's, it's uh, quite startling to see that number. And then the second one is Saudi Arabia 
Well, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are very similar. They are bordering countries. They're both in the Arabian Peninsula. They are both uh, mostly Muslim countries, but that's actually um, not a, a huge factor in this case as to why the, they have the highest share of their population as immigrants. Uh, but they are very similar culturally. So you'll have to check that article later this week whenever you're assigned that article about the United Arab Emirates and their migrant workers and see what's going on here. So this is what their population pyramid looks like. And you can see very much tilted to the male side. So not only do they have the largest percentage of their population as migrants, but also they have a funky looking population pyramid. Now I want you to notice something. This population pyramid is not weighted to the male side in the youth population. That kind of tells you something. So there's a lot of 20-something to 50-something men who are probably migrants from other countries, right? What are they doing in the UAE? You'll have to figure that out on your own. And uh, for today, that's all I got for you.